Hey, good morning. Um, Dr. Robin Trotman, infectious disease doctor at Cox Health in Springfield. Um, we're going to take a minute for people to log on. I think it's um, been three or four months since we uh, got together and talked about this pandemic. A um, little bit's changed since then. Uh, we'll give it a minute for people to uh, log on um, and uh, have a pretty robust, long agenda that's going to go real fast, uh, rapid fire on some topics um, that I was asked to address, um, some topics that uh, I want to address, uh, questions that I'm receiving and uh, things that I think are important and relevant and we'll, hopefully we'll get to We'll get to a point where people can put questions in the chat box. I guess it's message box or chat box. And then we'll have people monitoring those questions. Um, it looks like people are still uh, popping in. So we'll give it another uh, minute and uh, we'll start in. So yeah, I plan on sort of doing rapid fire description of the current situation and where we've been uh, overall. And just since our last update, we'll do that for about 20 minutes. And then uh, hit some of these common questions and then hopefully by 25 30 minutes we ought to be ready to start fielding some of these questions so um, I thought we'd start today talking about um, a little bit of background and I made some notes to cover and I think that by me talking about the timeline and the history of of the development of our vaccines you know really our one of our main goals right now is to help people understand the uh, safety and efficacy of these new vaccines to help uh, with vaccine uptake. Um, we still have a lot of people that have questions, and understandably so, about these vaccines. Um, but man, we have a ton of data. We have a ton of evidence that these are safe. And so um, some of the questions go back to uh, things like, how did this vaccine get approved so quickly? What is an emergency use authorization? This these vaccines aren't actually FDA approved. And, and so in order to understand what that means, we really have to understand the timeline of how we got these vaccines. So let me just uh, digress, uh, sit back, relax, enjoy this uh, little uh, history review of, of how far we've come in such a short time and, and why I want people to understand that, that those guardrails and those safety processes that go through Typical development of a drug or a vaccine, they, they haven't been um, bypassed in any way. They've just been accelerated. So let's think about, uh, go back to November 2019, and there was, in China, there was an unidentified, uh, strange, uh, often severe respiratory illness. So November of 19, and then in January, January 9th, the WHO said, hey, there's this uh, virus that's causing this syndrome that looks like SARS, and by January, we had a sequence of the virus. We had the RNA in the virus sequence. So we knew all of the blueprint, all of the genetic material of the virus in January. That's fast to go from describing an illness to finding the bug, to sequencing the bug, and then to sharing those sequencing data across the world. And then January 21st was our first identified case in the US in Seattle, you'll remember that. So. Um, we also, about that time, figured out there was human-to-human -human transmission. If you remember, originally, they thought it was going to be what's called zoonotic, meaning uh, straight from the animal to the person. And uh, it really took uh, the folks in China a few, um, a couple months to discover or to release the information that, no, this is indeed transmitted from person to person. And then, so that puts us at uh, mid-January, and then by early March, the WHO described this as a quote, pandemic, meaning it's going to affect the entire world. And then March 13th, the U.S. Uh, declared it a national emergency. So syndrome in November, March, it's a national emergency. And then um, July 14th, we had original data, the original data on the safety of the Moderna vaccine. So as soon as we sequenced that virus in January, they started looking at using RNA technology, which the virus is an RNA virus, we can sequence and make RNA in a, in a, in a lab on the order of kilograms. It's a, it's, a, 
it's just molecules, but we can make buckets and buckets of this stuff. So, so it was decided since we had experience with using um, RNA vaccines in the past, not commercial experience, but commercial, but, but experience using this as a platform, it was decided to use those as some of our uh, key strategies to building a vaccine rapidly, uh, inexpensively, and, and on a large scale. So July, we had our first Moderna data. Then July 27th, Moder Moderna phase three data came out. We started with those trials, or didn't come out, started those trials, the phase three trials. And keep in mind, it's, it's a lot easier to do a trial when a disease is prevalent. So when you're looking at the efficacy of a vaccine, if you have a high disease burden, a lot of people getting infected, you're going to see separation in the vaccine and the placebo quicker. So those trials ran really quick because, you know, if they enrolled 17,000, 20,000 people in the vaccine arm, there were enough infections in the placebo because the disease was so rampant at that time that those trials went very fast um, because so many people got sick in the placebo arm. You have to stop those trials. You can't keep giving placebo when you clearly have a safe and effective vaccine. So it, by the end of January, the government had invested in, uh, I think the Trump, no, by August, the Trump administration had allocated 1.5 billion for 100 million doses. So the government was subsidizing these uh, vaccine trials and buying the vaccine in advance. Typically the way a drug study works is you do a phase one study, you stop, then you do a phase two, stop. And the drug companies have to raise money, there's venture capital, they have to raise the money to build the vaccine, but they don't do that until they have proof that it's safe and effective. In this case, the vaccine doses were purchased before the vaccine um, was actually uh, manufactured. So that long step of having to uh, go out, raise money, um, and manufacture the vaccine, that was all done pre-approval, which happened in December. So um, we started the phase three trials into July, and then December 10th, the FDA advisory group approved the Pfizer vaccine. You remember how rapid fire this was. December 11th, the, the emergency use authorization was released. December 7th, Moderna went through the same process, the FDA advisory group, and then the EUA. So all of that happened really in the span of under one year from having the sequence of the virus. The process was the exact same as typical approval of a drug except for we don't have years and years of outcome data. Really the difference in an EUA and a full approval would be, do we know after three years if this vaccine still works? Well, no, we don't have that luxury, right? We're in the throes of a pandemic um, and we have, you know, two to 3,000 people dying a day in the U.S. Like it would be unethical to wait for two to three years on, on efficacy data when we need the vaccine now. So that's really the main distinction. People should understand the safeguards were there. I've reviewed the data uh, very closely. We have ongoing uh, post-marketing data, um, it's not post-approval data, um, where we know what's happening to these people. We're reporting that. We have active surveillance with, with an app where people can report side effects, and there's a heightened sense of awareness looking for side effects. So, so far, uh, none, of the, none of the guardrails, none of the safety uh, protocols for typical approval of a drug or vaccine have been um, bypassed. Um, it's really about not having full approval because of that long-term efficacy data. But we need to get out of the throes of this pandemic today, so we're not going to have that luxury. And then a lot of people ask me, will there be a full approval for this vaccine? You know, the, the drug companies may not have the incentive since the um, vaccines have already been purchased. Um, so they're not going to have that incentive to go for full approval, but um, clearly the, the numbers needed to uh, receive full approval, they've already been accomplished, the safety's there. It's more of a logistical process, um, and that may happen in the future, especially if we go to things like a booster, um, especially if we move into giving it to lower, um, younger age groups. So that's sort of the history that I hope people will uh, appreciate how rapid this process was, yet what was actually going on. These trials were being done in parallel. So we already had phase one um, data right off the bat. I was following the, the Janssen study early on um, last summer when they were giving it to monkeys and showing that when they gave uh, COVID, when they gave SARS-CoV-2 infection to the monkeys after vaccine, they couldn't get the virus out of their nose or their, their lungs. Really incredible uh, preclinical data on these vaccines. 
but at the same time, they were starting to manufacture the vaccine, hoping that it would be safe in the animal models so they could deploy it to people. But those trials still happen. They just started making the vaccine for the humans in advance, anticipating that it would be safe. But the same safeguards were in place. So let's pivot to um, some data, and I'm going to talk about the vaccine um, process in the state of Missouri and then here at Cox Health. Keep in mind these numbers move, but um, I believe in Missouri there have been about 2.5 million doses of vaccine administered. And what that means is about 1.5 million people have received the first of a two dose series. The Johnson or the Janssen uh, vaccine is a one dose vaccine, but we haven't received um, very many doses of it. So, really, we're talking about the two mRNA vaccines for the most part when we talk about these numbers. But two and a half million doses in Missouri with about 25% of eligible people um, having received the, vac the, the first dose. So here's some good news. 66% of those over 65 years old have had a first dose. That's a big deal. I mean, that's starting to get to having some degree of uh, baseline protective immunity in that population of 65-year-olds and having taken care of hundreds or thousands of COVID patients in the hospital age is really the big risk factor. That's the really vulnerable group. So it was super important that we prioritize those. We did that um, at Cox Health. Even within our uh, phase 1B2, uh, people with certain medical conditions, we really prioritize the older uh, patients first. And, and we're seeing that bear out in the fact that you know hospital admissions are coming down, deaths are coming down. Um, here at Cox Health, we've administered 61,000 doses approximately. That's probably changed since this morning. We have 7,000 approximately healthcare workers that have received um, a dose of one of the two mRNA vaccines. So that's good news. I mean, I think we have 12 to 13, 14,000 uh, people that work in and about our healthcare system. So we're maybe at half. We really want to get that number up. It's a big deal to have our healthcare workers safe. And here's the reason why. At the height of this disease, we had 15 to 20 healthcare workers testing positive per day. So people who work at or in uh, Cox Health, uh, 15 to 20 per day testing positive. Most of these infections were in the community. Um, we know that, we did tracings. We had some people get sick in the hospital, but it was rare and it was often healthcare worker to healthcare worker. Rarely was it um, a known COVID patient transmitting to a healthcare worker. Um, those number of uh, infections really stabled off when we went to universal masking. We proved with 100% certainty that wearing that mask on the patient and the healthcare worker prevents transmission because we had on a daily basis dozens of patients come in with COVID-19 unannounced, healthcare workers wearing a mask, eye protection. They treated the patient unknown that they had COVID at the time and the healthcare workers didn't get, didn't get sick. So, we track those exposures and we can say with certainty that those masks work to prevent transmission from infected people, especially when both people are wearing the mask. But looking back, if we had 15 to 20 healthcare workers testing positive per day since the vaccine, uh, since the prevalence has gone down in the community as well, of course we know that, um, we have about one healthcare worker per day. So we went from 15 to 20 at the peak down to about one person testing positive per day. We went from a peak of 500 leave of absence, so 500 healthcare workers with a leave of absence to either care for their family or out of work for uh, isolation for themselves, down to about 23 in March. So these are really impressive numbers. It's really helped stand up our healthcare system. We now no longer are at crisis level in some of our uh, mitigation strategies. So super encouraging. And if if what's happened within the healthcare, and this is not unique to Cox, as I uh, talk with colleagues around the U.S. I mean, this is a common theme. We're all uh, we're all really enjoying the um, having all of our coworkers back. Um, it's good to see people not getting sick. Um, we haven't had any healthcare workers sick in, in the hospital and uh, since the vaccine rollout. The other question people are going to have is it is it safe? That's the big question. And in our little bubble of having given 61,000 doses, you know, we've had one person with a that ended up in the hospital with some type of severe reaction. Don't know if it was specifically related to the vaccine. We have had people that have had uh, vasovagal, meaning they feel like they're going to pass out. Uh, that's common with all vaccines. Um, I've been asked, why does this vaccine have 6% fatality rate? That That's not even remotely a number that we're dealing with. We haven't had anybody die from this vaccine. And, you know, now we're talking about end of December, 
So, you know, we're talking about good three to four months of, you know, Pfizer was a couple weeks before. We're talking about going on four months of safety data where we have no signals of any serious adverse events other than some of those immediate allergic type reactions, which are pretty rare. They're, they almost always happen during that observation period. Um, you know, you get the vaccine, you have to stick around for uh, 15 minutes or so and, and be observed. So um, any reactions that we've seen have usually occurred during that time period. I want to talk now about some exciting data. This is going to be my editorial liberty to translate some of the science that's come out in the last couple of weeks uh, and, and um, talk about some highlights and some encouraging um, new evidence. So in MMWR, the journal for the CDC uh, this week, um, there was a study published where they vaccinated um, a bunch of healthcare workers um, and then they subsequently tested them in their nose for SARS-CoV-2. And we know that the vaccine is almost 100% effective in preventing you from getting sick and in the hospital and dying. We know that it's about 80% effective in preventing you from having a positive test. So people are still going to get infected. They're still going to cough and sneeze on a vaccinated person. So we're still going to be able to find virus in the nose of fully protected and immune people. The good news is they don't go on and get sick. So we call that asymptomatic infection. So they're infected, there's virus in their nose, but they're asymptomatic. So what they did is they, they vaccinated all these healthcare workers and then they tested them and they found that it's about, uh, that it's almost completely protective against asymptomatic infection and no subsequent transmissions. So this, this study in MMWR, multi-site study, very encouraging that when you get the vaccine, not only do you not get sick, but you don't have much virus in your nose very often, even when exposed, and you don't transmit. Another paper from the Mayo Clinic, they looked at their pre-procedure testing. So if you come in, get admitted to the hospital or are going to have surgery or a procedure, we often do a swab of the nose to see if you have COVID in your nose, if you're asymptomatic and infected. And they looked at about 40,000 people in December and January when the height of the pandemic, when there was... Uh, the prevalence was really high. And they found that of those people that tested positive, pre-procedure, totally asymptomatic, there was about an 80% protection conferred by having received the vaccine. So of the people who tested positive, very few people had been vaccinated. So what that means, that's in two different ways, that in two different pieces of evidence have studied vaccinated people, do they test positive? And then of the people who tested positive, how often they were vaccinated. So we looked at the same phenomena in two different ways, and we have about the same results. So that's really encouraging to me that these vaccines are pretty effective in preventing asymptomatic infection and transmission. Another couple of pieces of good information, some, some encouraging data are about our monoclonal antibodies. So if you do get sick and you're in one of these high-risk age groups, for instance, older or maybe have diabetes or lung diseases, um, often we'll treat people with what we call passive immunity, meaning uh, monoclonal antibody therapy. That's where um, they engineered uh, antibodies. So we make you immune by giving you a dose of this medicine. These originally, they weren't real impressive with their data, but what we know is if you give two different monoclonal antibodies, so antibodies that bind to two different parts of that spike protein, much more effective and really help keep people from dying and, and from going in the hospital. The more encouraging data, and this is going to be hard to explain, so bear with me here. The AstraZeneca, a lot of questions about AstraZeneca. Um, it's going to be an effective vaccine, but more importantly, is sort of this existential question about the safety and the process of approving vaccines. And I think this AstraZeneca, a uh, little bit of a blunder in how they reported their data. They uh, released their results in a press release, um, and then uh, that was scrutinized, and we came back and we said, hey, your figure's on 79, 75% efficacy. You may have misquoted and cherry-picked some of the data. And so what this means to me is that the process, the guardrails that are in place uh, are working. Um, the data is not being intentionally or accidentally falsified. Uh, the scrutiny is high and the uh, safety is ensured by this process. So we won't make any moves until the uh, FDA's advisory group looks at the actual data. 
big difference in press release data. So what we saw is that our processes appear to be uh, in place and are very encouraging to me that um, that we're looking at these vaccines really critically. We're not just pushing them through for the sake of pushing them through. However, if you do look at all of the aggregate data from the AstraZeneca vaccine, a whole new platform, or, or it's a different uh, viral vector platform, 100% effective at preventing um, severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Um, and then to just today, data were released on the Pfizer vaccine where they gave it to a couple thousand kids uh, age 12 to 15, 100 percent effective in preventing trans or preventing infections. So uh, I never thought I'd see the day when we would be using uh, 95 plus uh, percent effective numbers for uh, vaccines. A couple other quick things we've learned recently. Schools likely safe. You know, a year ago when we talked about school opening, boy, we all had a lot of trepidation. We were scared. Um, what's it going to look like when we send kids to school? Because we know in the winter, um, that's sort of the uh, amplifier of, of respiratory illnesses. And what would happen uh, when we reopen schools? Well, uh, some big trials done, published uh, by the CDC and Missouri and several other states have looked at, can you safely open school um, with some degree of mitigation, typically meaning mask when they're in the kids are in the classroom, and limiting proximity, maybe down to three feet. So it looks to me like big change from where we were a year ago, probably even uh, four months ago, last time we talked, is that schools can be reopened safely if those mitigation strategies are able to be adhered to cautiously. These studies, the one in Missouri, they actually looked at kids that were exposed in the school. When you do this physical distancing and masking, tested those kids, and we weren't finding a high degree of uh, transmission and asymptomatic infection in the school. So really encouraging data on how to safely uh, reopen schools. A couple other things we know is that, you know, we talked about these antigen tests and some of these less well-performing rapid antigen tests. We said, ah, those aren't good. They're going to miss a lot of people. But something that we've learned in the last few months is that there are strategies to use those tests. It really has to do with the frequency that you administer those tests. So for instance, frequent testing on the same group of people, maybe every week, uh, on regular intervals with rapid reporting of positive results can prevent ongoing community transmission. So that's a big lesson that we've learned in the last few months is that while the test performance in any individual patient may not be great, it may have false negatives, it may miss people, but if you do it repeatedly in the community, the real world data that we've experienced now, it suggests that um, this can prevent ongoing community transmission. So that's a big lesson learned. And those tests are going to be available in schools, in higher education, um, you know, in healthcare systems. We've been using them in nursing homes and things like that. So that's good news. Here are a couple questions that I want to field before we go to the um, online live questions. Uh, does receipt of a vaccine change the results of a test? So the answer to that is um, no. Um, the vaccines are spike protein uh, uh, antigen. So it puts spike protein into your body and you make an immune response and it will not impact the results of a test. So if you are infected or not infected, the results of a nasopharyngeal PCR are what they are regardless of having received the vaccine. We know if you've received the vaccine, you're less likely to test positive, but the results should be interpreted the same in vaccinated people. I hope that makes sense. Another question is, another uh, PSA is always get your two doses. Um, you might have more uh, vaccine related uh, side effects, meaning fever and fatigue. I know I did, um, my family did. Uh, the second vaccine, um, short-lived, you're going to have a little more side effects. Be prepared, but it's super important for the durability of the vaccine. We don't want people's immunity to wane after three or four months. So I really want people, I really want to emphasize, get that second shot. And keep in mind, you can still test positive. You're still going to get exposed if we don't use the mask. Think about the distancing. All those, medic all those mitigation strategies have to stay in place um, because there's still going to be sick people out there. They're still going to cough. You're still going to get viral RNA in your nose, and your mouth, you're going to test positive. The good news is you're much less likely to get sick. So we really need to keep our foot on the gas. I, I think it's really important that we all understand um, going forward, the vaccines are 
almost 100% effective in preventing death, 95% effective in preventing severe disease, probably 80% effective in preventing asymptomatic infection. That means 20% of the people still have the potential to transmit to those other uh, vulnerable people who haven't been vaccinated. So these are all good, these are all good news, um, but we still have gaps. We're not quite there. These are the things we can do going forward. I don't think it's time to let our foot off the gas. We really need a large fraction of the population to be vaccinated to, before we feel comfortable that ongoing transmission in the community is gonna stop. Um, this number might be 25, 30% in a local community, assuming that maybe 25 to 30% of the population have already been infected. Um, we know that the vaccine is not, the young children aren't candidates for the vaccine. So we're not gonna hit those 70 to 80% um, immune in the population to get that herd immunity. So I do think um, that there is some good guidance from the CDC. It takes in mind this low rate of asymptomatic transmission. So you and your family who are vaccinated can um, be together uh, without the masking. Um, there's some good diagrams on uh, cdc.gov that gives some infographics on if one's vaccinated and one's not, what can you do and how can you move about community? So I'd refer people there. I do think, I, I do wanna talk about the um, technology that we've evolved with these RNA vaccines and how encouraging this is for just global health. Like I said, uh, mRNA can be made in a, in a jar, in a, in a lab uh, on the order of kilograms. I mean, millions and millions of doses can be manufactured. We know it's safe. The delivery vehicle is safe. We know the mRNA goes away. Your body digests that after a day or two. So thinking about mRNA vaccines as a technology going forward, is there potential to use this for other diseases around the world, like HIV, tuberculosis, measles, cancer? Um, these are going to be the platforms. I mean, these are gonna be the disease states where you're gonna hear about these mRNA platforms in the future. And I think it's really, really exciting for me because we're at the cusp. We're gonna see this technology evolve. And we're gonna see some of these diseases start to we're starting to bend the curve on, gosh, if we could bend the curve on malaria around the world and TB and HIV, I mean, uh, millions of countless lives would be saved. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is just sort of this mile high view, the sort of global view. Keep in mind, there's if there's two about 200 countries on the globe, okay, um, US being one of them, uh, of those 200, 130 countries have never given a single dose of vaccine. So there's a global inequity issue here. Um, we have inequities in disease prevalence in the US in disease severity, and we have inequity in uh, vaccine uptake. So we need to make sure that we're really emphasizing and communicating to our populations in our communities, um, especially the populations most affected by this virus. Um, we need to make sure they have equal access to the vaccine, and that applies to the globe as well. We're not safe until the entire planet is immune to this virus. We showed this in um, November, December. Um, we're one plane flight away from everybody on the globe. So we have to change our thinking from just, you know, obviously take care of ourselves, take care of our family, our community. And we also have to look at the uh, 8, million 8 billion people on the globe. So I think that's all I wanted to say. I know that was a lot. I think I'm going to pivot to some questions now. Good. So the variants are the, the that's sort of the question of the day. So um, all human pathogens evolve over time, meaning um, their genetic material is going to change, and it's going to change in a way that is advantageous for its survival. So these viruses naturally make mistakes. RNA viruses tend to make fewer mistakes than DNA virus, or make more mistakes than DNA viruses. So this virus is really, really at risk for making mistakes in its genetic reproduction. And then that gives different looking viruses over time. And if one of those different looking viruses has some sort of advantage and, and infects the host a little more tightly, a little more efficiently, then that virus is gonna reproduce and become the dominant strain. 
we started detecting these in Missouri early on. I've worked with the folks at Mizzou and at a, at a reference lab, and we started sequencing virus very early, and we found lots of random mutations. Those random mutations, when they are advantageous, when they're good for the virus to have this new mutation, that new virus that, that has it is called a variant. So we have variants around the world that appear to be maybe more infectious. Maybe they make you a little more sick too. The 117 originally described in the UK, maybe that makes you a little more sick, rapidly became the dominant um, variant in Europe. We have little hot pockets around the world where other viruses have evolved just a little bit differently in South Africa, in Brazil, in California. Each one of these virus variants is going to have some sort of unique adaption that either allows it to transmit more easily um, or maybe escape the immune system or maybe escape some of our antiviral drugs. Remdesivir is one of our antiviruses. Typically, you see bacteria eventually become resistant to antibiotics. We're not seeing that with remdesivir, but we have seen that with the monoclonal antibodies. So some of these strains that have specific mutations in the spike protein, the bamlanivimab, the first of the monoclonal antibodies, may not because it binds that spike protein, and that spike protein's a little bit different enough because of this genetic mutation that this monoclonal antibody doesn't bind. And so that therapy is not effective. Up to this point, um, the AstraZeneca vaccine, when given in South Africa, where there's a certain variant, uh, not as effective. Highly effective in preventing death. All of these vaccines with all variants have showed good protection against severe disease and death. So that's where we start. That's the good news. The good news is the vaccines we're receiving now, the mRNA vaccines, the Janssen or J&J &J va &J vaccine, appear to be effective against all the circulating strains in the U.S. right now. So that's good news. Um, but again, we don't want to change the course of what we have. We have good news. We want to continue good news. We don't want to let our guard down. Um, for these viruses to mutate and become new uh, super variants, they have to have ongoing reproduction. They have to have a host. If they don't infect somebody, they're not going to reproduce and evolve. So the way you stop the evolution of these variants um, is by preventing ongoing transmission. That's one of the main reasons to keep up with these mitigation strategies. You get the full dose of vaccine so that you're immune. The virus doesn't reproduce in you. If you do get asymptomatic infection with the mask, with these other mitigation strategies, you don't transmit and no further evolution happens. So um, I think the, 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 the variants have received a lot of attention in the news. Um, for all intents and purposes right now, uh, everything is full speed ahead and I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Right. So this is a question that concerns a lot of people, understandably so. Um, in, in virology, so uh, the question is about fetal tissue in the vaccine. Good question, understandably so. Um, a lot of misinformation, a lot of confusion. Um, I can tell you, I personally wouldn't want a vaccine that had aborted fetal tissue in it. So let me start with that. I am not, um, I am very understanding of this concern. When you do virology, when you do molecular biology, a lot of what we do in medicine and laboratory work, and I've done this work personally, is we grow things in the lab using a cell culture. So you keep a tissue culture alive so that you can grow this virus, study this virus, and um, do things like with the adenovirus vector vaccine. So the J&J &J vaccine uses uh, adenovirus that is known to cause disease in humans, but can infect humans. And they put this gene for the spike protein in that virus. Now you have to grow that virus in a way, and you have to study that virus and, and do tests on it. So in the lab, it was grown in a cell culture um, that was originally I think in the early 90s is where the cell culture came from, from I think it was uh, a retina cell from a fetus. So um, the virus had been grown in a cell culture line from uh, a fetus that, I, and we don't, I don't know anything other than that, 
um, that has been an immortal cell line, meaning that cell tissue culture has been used in labs for lots of therapeutics. It's a very common uh, tissue culture line that is used for multiple um, platforms. So a lot of drugs, a lot of viruses have been studied um, using this one particular um, immortal tissue culture line. And these cells originally came, um, I guess, 30 years ago from, uh, I think it was um, uh, fetus uh, retina cell. So there's no um, aborted fetus in the vaccine. Um, it was the cell culture used to study and manufacture the virus. Um, so I hope that answers those questions. Um, next. Yeah, that's good news. That's today. So um, I think I spoke to that earlier. Um, they gave, I think, 1,300, 1,500 kids the vaccine. The other got the placebo. 100% effective. It, like I said, 100% effective Pfizer vaccine. Uh, those are hard claims. Now, these are press releases. Keep in mind, we look at these with optimism, but some degree of trepidation, right? We, we, we've seen press releases where the actual data would look different. But what it means is that uh, there's no reason, uh, there's not a lot of reason to think that a vaccine in a 14-year-old is going to be less safe than in a 16-year-old, keeping in mind the variability and development across that age. So I'm encouraged. I'm glad the studies are undergoing. I can tell you um, from contacts in Columbia, Kansas City, uh, and St. Louis, people are really looking to uh, get this process rolled up because we know we have to look at, people are going to say, well, why vaccinate kids? They don't die. But let me tell you, kids have some serious complications. What if your kid is a state champ uh, track athlete and he has he or she has COVID? They're not running for a few weeks. And then some of the regulatory bodies say there's an even longer restriction from participation. So kids are being affected in multiple ways, all the way from uh, being uh, isolated and ostracized in school, all the way to the um, multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome that we see in kids all the way to uh, some children, especially with pre-existing conditions, going on and having pneumonia, hospitalized, and even death. So there's such a continuum in children that goes all the way from uh, mortality to hospitalization. Plus, they transmit the disease. We're never going to be safe until kids are vaccinated and immune. When we know they can't transmit disease and we're all immune, that's when we're going to start to stand down and we're going to go, we've reached We've reached near the end, but not until kids are vaccinated. So I'm encouraged by the fi Pfizer data, uh, always a little bit of trepidation, um, but it's not surprising. I am surprised when they say 100 percent. It's only 13, 1400 people. What will happen is they will apply for an addendum to the uh, FDA's uh, EUA, and um, there will be certain kids with certain disease, uh, pre-existing conditions likely, um, who maybe even this summer would be candidates for vaccine. So a lot of pregnancy, a lot of breastfeeding questions, um, I, and this is not my uh, area of expertise because we've really deferred these conversations to ladies and their um, OBGYN, their obstetrician, or their family practice doctor taking care of them. Um, no signals uh, of any uh, serious adverse events. Uh, lots of people have become pregnant after being vaccinated. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, signals in the data to give concern. But uh, again, I'm really emphasizing these are these are risk benefit conversations that people need to have with their provider. And our obstetricians are very, very adept at these conversations. They're ready. They're having them every day. Um, they, they typically sit down, take the time. It's really about the mom's risk tolerance and understanding of consequences of having COVID-19. So, um, so far, no uh, worrisome signals uh, in the data. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's a conversation that's worth having ASAP. Yeah, so people who are on immunosuppressive drugs, or have inherent immunodeficiencies, there's no, they need the vaccine. Um, there's not going to be an adverse outcome 
an increase in adverse events from the vaccine. It's just that you may, re they may respond less well. So obviously if you're, because a vaccine elicits your immune system, if your immune system is inherently weak or weak due to medications, obviously your response to the vaccine is going to be uh, less than optimal, certainly less than the, the 15 year olds in the Pfizer trials. They're going to have the most robust immune response. Young adults, um, older adults, immunity wanes. They have fewer uh, immunogenicity type of side effects, the fever uh, in older adults, and they also respond less well. As far as having an autoimmune disease that is triggered by the vaccine, there's certainly reports of people having autoimmune diseases that are triggered. Um, that's such a vast array of diseases. I mean, autoimmune could be anything from you know, diabetes to thyroid disease to vasculitis. So it's really too, it's really impossible to comment on that whole bucket of diseases. But in general, um, it's a conversation you have with your doctor. I guess it depends on the severity of your of your autoimmune disease. Um, is there a treatment for your autoimmune disease? Are you already under treatment? But we're not seeing signals in the data of things like uh, vasculitis flaring up after the vaccine. After COVID infection, yes, for sure. Lots of that, what we now call some people long haul, it's maybe it's called uh, post-acute COVID uh, syndromes. Um, a lot of weird manifestations in that period after having had COVID, the majority having been asymptomatic. And then we're seeing after those infections, we are seeing um, flares of some of these diseases. So, yep, good questions. For the mRNA vaccines, the safety data. Um, the anaphylactic reactions are very rare. Um, we monitor for those and they almost always happen during the observation period. Um, we have good treatments for anaphylactic reactions and those people who have had serious immediate adverse reactions typically have a history of having had these in the past. So for the general person who's never had any allergic reactions and has um, few medical problems, the vaccine adverse event rate is very low. I'll tell you, you're going to have soreness at the injection site. You're going to potentially have a fever. You might have a headache and be fatigued. Each of those mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, both had you know 17, 20,000 in the experimental group. Um, and what we're seeing uh, after having given 60,000 doses at Cox, um, 2.5 million in the state, my conversations with colleagues, really mirrors what we saw in those original phase three studies is that the second dose more immunogenetic genetic you're going to have more uh immune reaction all those things i said fever fatigue uh headache and soreness um but really that's the extent of what we're looking at um, long-term side effects uh th there don't appear to be i've said this in other talks um, we've only been doing this now since um, November, you know, August, November, December. So we're talking uh, really six, seven months of safety data for those first recipients of the phase three trials. They're still being followed. So you can bet if there were signals in those original people in the Pfizer and Moderna studies, we'd be seeing those um, those long term uh, side effects. But, you know, with most vaccines, serious side effects are seen in the first 90 days after receipt. It's it's really not a phenomenon where you see a vaccine late, late side effect, meaning six months to a year. We almost all, always see those signals after the first two or three million doses are given, after the first three or four months. Um, so I don't anticipate any new unforeseen um, side effects. Keep in mind, mRNA, that little molecule, it's in your body after that vaccine. It's been denatured by our own cells, um, attacks those molecules and digests them. So that, that, uh, mRNA is gone. So if you've had COVID, you still need the vaccine. If you want to wait, if, you know, the, the, the original issue was we told people consider waiting because we had such a scarcity of vaccine. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now that the supply is ramping up, I, I think you need to go ahead and get in line. You're not, some people 
didn't want to receive the vaccine out of altruism. They said, I don't want someone who needs it to get it if I've already, if I still have some protection from having recently had um, COVID-19. Obviously, if you just had COVID, we don't want you in the healthcare system if you're still under isolation, if you're under quarantine for an exposure. Um, but once you feel better, you want to go ahead and get the vaccine. Lots of people have taken the vaccine at day 11 after having had COVID. Um, there's no logical, uh, medical, theoretical uh, risk to doing that, and it's not playing out in our experiences. Um, we don't know how long immunity lasts after natural infection. We know that it starts to wane. We don't even know what is the correlate of immunity. People say, well, my antibody levels. But your antibody levels may not be the lab test value that definitively predicts protection. There's other parts of your immune system that, that add protection to infection, and we're not assessing those uh, clinically. They're assessed in clinical trials. So we don't really know how long the immunity from natural disease lasts. We know it's not long, you know, 9, 60, 90, 120 days. Um, so that booster of that vaccine is going to prime. Your immune system's been primed and said, hey, I've seen this spike protein. I make some antibodies, my T cells and memory cells, they, they see it. But when you hit it again with that antigen, that spike protein, it really embeds that memory into your immune system and it ensures that you're gonna have longer, more durable protection. I can tell you that based on the literature, the vaccine confers better protection against severe disease than prior infection. So we have had people become infected and even die a second time from natural disease. We, we're not seeing that in vaccinated people who get the vaccine and then have a positive test. So we also want to make sure you don't transmit. And we know the vaccine is more effective in preventing transmission than natural diseases, probably, at least for some period of time. So we're really trying to reduce transmission. We're trying to prolong your immunity by giving the vaccine after having had disease. And we're trying to make sure you have better, more durable uh, protection. Yeah, good question. So if the vaccine was only intended to prevent death in the person who received the vaccine, then we probably wouldn't give it to as many people. However, our first round was, right? When we first had the vaccine, we wanted to vaccinate healthcare workers uh, who are being exposed, and we wanted to vaccinate uh, patients in nursing homes. So we've done that. We've accomplished that. That was to save lives. Now we're moving into a phase of vaccination where our goal is to prevent transmission. Now we'll still save lives because not everybody will be protected. But right now we want to vaccinate young people so that here's a bunch of reasons. They don't transmit. We have new data saying if you get vaccinated and you get exposed to SARS-CoV-2, you don't have asymptomatic infection or transmit very often. So we want to prevent transmission. We know there are other consequences of having COVID-19. It's not just death. What about long COVID? What about these people who have fevers and aches and have symptoms? I see them regularly and they have, they don't die, they don't end up in the hospital, but they do have long-term side effects. Why vaccinate a kid? Well, what if a kid needs a safe meal every day and a safe place to go to school and they have to be isolated for 10 days plus because they, um, they get exposed? We need that kid in school. We need people in the workforce. We need our healthcare workers working. So there are other reasons besides just death. That's a, that's a question, that's an argument that people make. Why give a vaccine when very few people die? Well, you may not die, but your grandmother might die. My family might die. You know, my kids need to be in school just like your kids. We want the ecosystem to be immune so that we can start to resume a normal life, lifestyle. That's not going to happen until young people are preventing ongoing transmission in the community. So prevent disease that's not death. Yeah, they may not die, but there are other consequences. Get people back in their activities. You know, kids don't want to be out of their sports activities because they're constantly getting exposed to other kids and they miss a whole season of school or sports or activities. And then we want to protect our more vulnerable people in the population. Yeah, good question. I, I'm not as privy, but Distribution is ramping up, so um, we are receiving sufficient vaccine that 
it's possible by early or mid-May, the system may be open to a more traditional vaccine uh, deployment, meaning walk into your doctor's office, get the vaccine. Um, of course, these are multi-dose vials, so you want to give six or 11 doses at a time. So it's, it's not likely in the near future going to be where you can just pop in and get a vaccine in the middle of the day, mainly because of logistics and how you have to schedule those patients and observe them. But it, the vaccine supply is such that we will eventually be able to move away from these mass vaccination clinics. Um, the supply right now, where there's still higher demand than supply, I think that will start to pivot probably in the next month. And we'll be uh, looking for people, um, encouraging people, and, um, and we may have more supply than demand. But right now, demand is still higher than supply. Um, multiple, multiple, you know, I work with the governor on this and, and multiple modes of deployment, mass vaccinations. We've increased the people who can vaccinate. We're looking at uh, more pharmacy distribution and then the what's called high throughput healthcare systems like Cox and Mercy, um, where they can send larger fractions of vaccine and we can do these big um, clinics. So right now the supply is good. It's going to increase as the J&J &J or Janssen vaccine rolls out. Um, so No, I don't think so. I think we hit the key points. I think I reiterated and reiterated some of the things I wanted to emphasize. I am encouraged. I do, I do feel if people. I hope people. If this impacts your opinion of the vaccine, um, my family is vaccinated. Um, I'm vaccinated. Uh, my children, when they're in the age, they'll be vaccinated. I feel uh, increasingly comfortable as time passes. And as we see more and more people being exposed to COVID, to SARS-CoV-2, not getting COVID, as we learn more about transmission, I'm becoming increasingly convinced um, that it's highly effective, more effective than I could have imagined at the beginning. And I'm also feeling encouraged that we're not seeing large uh, signals of safety issues. So now that we're five or six months into people receiving this vaccine, um, Again, if it helps in your decision uh, process, I understand the trepidation. Um, but, uh, you know, my family, who I care about um, the most, um, have and will receive the vaccine. So I hope that speaks to the human part of this issue. Are we good? And I think I'm being told to sign off. So I appreciate everybody um, listening in. And um, I hope it answers some of your questions. And I just want everybody to stay safe and and know that uh, here at the hospital we're still um, we're still working hard. Uh, we still have sick patients, um, but uh, things are starting to look a lot better. We're working with your local health departments to try to forecast the future. When can we start to stand down on some of these mitigation strategies? So um, so all those things are in the work. So hang in there, be patient, and be safe. I'll see you next time.